Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I am honored today to have as a guest the next half an hour, special guest, exoneree and advocate for uh, those who have been wrongfully convicted and for social justi justice, Jeff Deskovich. Jeff joins us from Washington, D.C. Um, we're going to talk with Jeff later. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Thank you for coming on again. I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, so Jeff and I are going to listen with all of you to some of the clips of Skylar Richards' interview, especially when she discussed the burning of her child. Let's listen. Was this a false confession? Well, no better a person to discuss Gusko's last is the defense right than Jeff Deskovich. He was spent nearly, what, two decades in jail for a murder he did not commit, partially because as a teenager he was interrogated, he falsely confessed, and he's here to tell us what the truth is. So, Jeff, is this a compliant, coerced confession? Yeah, this is a coerced, compliant confession. So there's two types of false confessions. There's a coerced, compliant, where the uh, suspect knows that, uh, that, they, that they're innocent, but they're being coerced to go along. And then there's the internalized false confession, which is when the person being questioned comes to doubt their own innocence. Uh, this is clearly not a um, internal internalized uh, false confession because there's a uh, portion when she's questioned and uh, they and the, she is adamant that she did not use any uh, she did not set the uh, body on fire. But then she later so does, she, she later <laughs> does that. So do you find that this confession is number one contaminated? Uh, is it pro a problematic that the police were giving her the answers on it? And is there any uncertainty in her words that tells you this is a false confession? Yeah, there's all three. So it is contamination. So briefly, um, contamination means when the police give the suspect facts. So they're supposed to ask open-ended questions so that uh, when the suspect gives details, it'll be clear that they're they have guilty knowledge rather than they're repeating something that's already been in the public domain or that they've been told. So one example here in this interrogation uh, of contamination is um, the police uh, say to her, uh, tell me about the fire. And she replies, what fire? She then says, well, there's some evidence to show that there was some, some burning on her. So here, instead of asking an open-ended question, they've, they've told her that. So that's an example of, um, of contamination. What about there uncertainty? A, what about uncertainty? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there are 13 different examples uh, within, uh, within this interrogation of uncertainty. I'm just going to pick the uh, most obvious three. So uh, a question. So how long do you think that she was in the water? Answer, I don't remember. Now, somebody who committed a crime knows the answer to that. Uh, another one, uh, question, so what part of the remains? Like, did you start, like, at the, at the bottom, the top? Answer, I think the bottom. Question, was it dark? Answer, I think it was, like, in the middle of the night. So someone making up a story, somebody lying, albeit under, under coercion, they don't know what actually happened, and so they kind of hedge in their language to give themselves some space so that if they do get something wrong, they have, they have the, well, I, th I told you I think, as opposed to saying something in the definitive. But somebody who's actually committed, committed a crime, they know exactly what they did and what they didn't do. So that's as to uh, uncertainty, and both contamination and uncertainty are definitely red flags that have appeared in other cases that have ended in DNA exoneration, the convictions of which were caused by coerced false confessions. And what about the police giving her the answers in their question? Do you find examples yes. of that? Yes, exactly. Like, I, yes, there's, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's 13 examples, um, excuse me, there's 14 examples of that. In this case, again, I'll pick the uh, top three. So question, so is it possible that because you were on the toilet when you had her. Uh, okay, it is. So that's the question. Answer, yes. Another one, what, what part of the remains? Like, did you start like at the bottom, the top? Answer, I think the bottom. Question, uh, you just like the lighter on the feet or something? Answer, yes. Then one more, one more. Was it just like a cigarette lighter? Answer, just a lighter at my house. So they're giving her answers incorporated into her questions, and then she's latching on to the item. So with all of these numerous examples, uh, to me, this is pretty clear cut that this is a, this is a coerced uh, a false confession. So, Jeff, we're going to continue this conversation and look at more from uh, the defense experts when we come back with our other two lawyers and Jeffrey Deskovich. Stay tuned. Judge Wilcott, I'd like to bring you in. Question to you. I think if I look at this, this is a compliant, coerced confession. How come judges don't, on Miranda, throw these things out? Because they turn it over to the jury to determine whether or not it's truthful or not. So instead of throwing it out, 
they pass it along to the jury. And this is true nationwide, Linda. And is it a problem, Anthony? Yeah, in California, it's a problem. So, and I've have you, dealt with have, you have you dealt with this before? Have yes, you had a case that, that yes. that's exactly what happened? The judge refused to throw it out. I can tell you, as on the wrongful chair for a while, a co-chair uh, co of the uh, criminal convictions committee, wrongful convictions committee in New York, I couldn't even get this out for yeah. everyone to agree. It's a big uh, problem. Jeffrey Deskovich, how many of that's these wrongful awesome. confessions are there out there? You are now a lawyer. Thank you, thank you for, for being a lawyer after all you've done, and congratulations. Um, please tell us, give us a little bit of your education. Sure, so I have a, I have a master's degree from John Jay oh, College. Oh, I don't mean, I don't mean that, I mean in terms, I, I know oh, you're, sorry. I'm sorry, that was my fault to ask you that. How many wrongful confessions are there out there? How, what's the literature showing? Yeah, the literature shows that 25% of the DNA proven wrongful convictions were caused by uh, false confessions. I wanna quickly add that uh, particularly vulnerable populations are people with um, with mental health issues uh, as well as youth, which both of those elements are present in, in this case. Well, we just heard about holding her hand. Let's listen to the cross-examination by the prosecutor to uh, Dr. Bassman about whether the cops were being nice to her by holding her hand. Anthony Tall, do you believe this is a compliant, coerced, false confession? I do. I do. Judge Ashley Wilcott, do you believe this is a compliant, coerced, false confession? You know, I do, and I'll tell you one of the reasons is that hand-holding to establish a trust with her that was outside of the boundaries. I agree with that testimony. And Jeffrey Deskovich, again, you have been through it. You are now a lawyer. You're an exoneree. You're an advocate for us. The defense, what are one of the areas they could cross-examine on to get rid of this? Let me just hold, reach over here and hold my guest's hand to show him how much I like him. <laughs> sure. Well, the, the, the one area would be, I mean, the... They're asking Skylar questions to make it sound as though everything is understa understandable, which is coercive. But then another aspect is that she asks, you know, can I go home? And instead of them being uh, clear with her, they, they imply that it's a possibility. And that, that element of wanting to go home is a classic sign that's present in many of these uh, false confession cases. And, and if you were advising the defense, you tell them to go on that. What else would you tell them to do, Jeffrey? Because, I mean, I think I, this is horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would tell them that despite putting on the two experts that I think it's critical that they put their client on the stand. Uh, the everyday uh, citizens think that an innocent person would never confess, even though we, we gave the percentage already. I don't think it's enough to just rely on the experts. I think it's important to put your client on the stand and have her explain directly why she gave a false confession. And I also think it's critical for the defense to disprove as many elements of, the, as many of the statements in the confession as they can, even on minor points, just in order to be able to argue the overall that the confession is coerced and false and therefore should not be relied on by the jury. Jeffrey, you live this. To me, uh, I called you and you, you looked at all these tapes last night. I think that you are the most impressive advocate as to whether something is coerced. Have you ever testified in a courtroom as an expert on this as to the elements of a coerced confession? No, I haven't testified in the courtroom. I, I, have, I have reviewed uh, confessions and given, given um, opinions to lawyers, though. You are it's just amazing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jeffrey has a foundation, the Deskovitz Foundation. He, uh, as I said, he's now a lawyer. I thank you, Jeffrey, for coming on, spending all the time you did last night to review this so such an important question. I hope you will come back with me again on the Law and Crime Network to explain and educate our viewers that these things happen every single day. More than happy to. It's a wonderful program. I'm glad to share knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Beth. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Skylar Richardson, we will continue reviewing this case when we come back. Stay tuned. Long Crime Network.